Hello, welcome back and in this video I'm going to be going through C64 Tape Tool with a nice quick start introduction hopefully. So this Tape Tool contains two things. It contains the Tape Tool itself and also a Turbo Tape Framework which contains all of the source code and data files needed to allow you to master your own Turbo Data Tape Files. So you can go to this itch page which I've set up and download the software which I'm showing now. It's just a zip file. It's for Windows only unless you can run Windows executables in Linux and I know there are ways of doing this or Unix then you can use those as well. So here I'm just extracting the zip file and then we can just run the example build.bat file. This Windows security message is because I downloaded the zip file and it contains executables and DLLs. So Windows security by default will say that it's a little bit suspicious, but it's not. Don't worry about it. It's just flagged these executables because they were downloaded. Running the batch file runs all of the contents of the batch file. It saves compressed data. And then as you can see, it's created a tap file, which it automatically runs which then auto runs the tape turbo loader with something that looks like the old Nova load. And then we get into this scrolling message with music playing in the background. And then it goes into actually loading a bitmap loading screen. Now this turbo loading framework includes the ability to save compressed blocks in any order. That's why you can see the bitmap being built up in a different way as you would normally expect to see. Also it contains block compression so the black areas of the bitmap for example which don't contain any data compress a lot better. So you can see here that each block of say 243 bytes, um, well, 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 save 243 bytes rather, the original block size of 256 bytes was sometimes compressed down to 3 or 4 or 5 bytes for something which doesn't contain much data. which speeds up the loading process quite significantly. And then we get into this final demo of the multiplexer, which I've been working on, which is a standard library, which can be included in lots of different games. And I do use this multiplexer in lots of different games. This multiplexer is actually used in my CF Redux, for example, and the other games that I've been working on. Let's have a look at the bat file. The bat file is just a very simple batch file which sets up some initial configuration and in the default batch file that you download the Nova-ish load is the option is written to the config.a file there. The other options are to do with opening the borders and enabling the screen. If I want to change it to say for example uh, the different loader, say for example the Marty load, let's enable that one. There we go. The Marty load looks like the cyber load. Now, it assembles the loader framework with the options that were chosen and then put into the config.a file. And then it writes the binary data from the assembled output to include the auto run, uh, like the bootstrap code if you like which then loads the main part of the, the scrolling message, bitmap, music, playing, loader, and then it saves all of the other data too. So all of the other data comprises of uh, the real loading framework, the music, then the music is just a you know, standard kind of like music program file, which in this case loads at C00, and then it loads the three files for the Tusari bitmap logo, the screen, the color, and the bitmap data, and then it loads the test multiplexer demo and then right at the end it adds an extra lead out and it's a good idea to write an extra lead out so that if you're transferring the tap file to tape then you have some lead out before the tape motors stop so that you're writing the last few bits accurately and running that you can see that it's not showing the Nova-ish load it was showing the cyber load instead and then it goes through loading the same thing. Now, the little star, the exclamation mark, the minus sign that appears next to the numbers when they count down indicate that a block is being decompressed. So you can actually see on the screen 
what data is compressed well and what data doesn't compress well. The debug output from the tape tool also includes that extra information. What this bat, bat file does is that it takes the options and it pipes them through to the config.a file. The, the bat file doesn't have to do this. If you want to customize it and you want to keep the options in the config.a file, then you can certainly do that too. You don't have to keep on recreating this file. It's just one way of making sure that the right options are there. So these options are then pulled in through the assembly process to then enable the Nova-ish load or the small load or the Marty load or the tape loader with CIA, which uses a different kind of header format, but that's supported as well. But generally speaking, the options from here go into the config A file and then are picked up by the assembly. So here's what the config file looks like after the batch file runs, and you can see it's got these options enabled. So the tape turbo speed, which equals $80, is, is a good compromise between reliability and speed that I found works quite well with most tape decks and most tape duplication. Some games that were released in the last few years use this framework or a version of this framework and I think they use the same tape turbo speed so you can reliably use that. Now one of the good features about this loading framework is that it does actually handle loading errors in a nice friendly way so if one of the blocks say for example has a loading error or if you're saving out full files and it has a loading error because it uses a checksum to check this then it will ask you to stop the tape deck, rewind a bit, and then press play, and then it will try and retry the, the load for that data which was corrupted. So we can show that here by using the emulator to introduce an error to the load. So we'll use the data set settings and we'll change it so that it has a large random wobble value. Actually, that makes it very difficult for the loader to actually detect that it should be finishing loading the block. So we'll we'll change it to a smaller loader wobble value. There we go. We've got a load error now. So it says press stop. So we can change the, the, the random wobble back to zero in the emulator, but we'll, we'll stop the tape and it detects that stop was pressed. And it then says rewind the tape and then press play. So that's what we'll do. We'll rewind the tape and then we'll press play and then it will show this countdown progressing as it loads new data. Also the sprites will pulse uh, their color cycling as they go through. The two sprites there are in the top and bottom borders. Yeah, this tape loader also has the option of enabling or disabling or opening the borders rather as well, which is quite a neat little trick that is customizable. You can either turn this on or off and that's an option that goes into the config A file as well. Here we go. So it finished loading the bitmap, but the bit because there was a load error, the bitmap display was switched off and it went back to showing the, the text prompts for what you need to do to stop the tape, rewind the tape, and then press play again. So now it's still loading in the background now, even though the loading bitmap is not being displayed it's still progressing with loading the next part which is the multiplexer demo and there we go so the tape loading framework allows you to recover quite easily from load errors which was a useful feature that was in some games but not others uh, i do know i do re seem to remember that some of the elite compilations on tape uh, seem to have a block load error detection routine, but certainly not every single game had such a feature. So if we wanted to make the loader simpler and reduce the size of the code, then we can do that. So we can say, for example, remove the bitmap display option from the code. And we can do that by removing the define for bitmap display from the config A file. Now, because we're not loading the bitmap, we would also need to change the file name number because the file names are bytes and these file name numbers are incremented by one for every file that it loads. So it loads the sprite data for the sprite, it loads the music data, and then it would, if it was loading the bitmap, load three extra files and then the multiplexer demo. But because we're only loading the sprite and the music 
and then we want to load the, the multiplexer demo, we need to set also this start on file name number. As you can see here, the, the zero file byte for, 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 the, for the file name basically, it starts loading from zero and then it adds on one for every time it has finished loading the data from the previous file. This is what this code does here. So we need to save out the, the file name numbers in sequence, basically. So we can change the bat file to alter the data that we save, but also to remove that configuration option for the bitmap display, of course. So let's comment out this line here for the bitmap display so it won't go to the config file now. And then the start on file number, we will also change that to be three instead of the default that it is, is five. So we will pipe that new option or redirect that new option rather to the config.a file. It's actually underscore config.a. Now, because we don't want to display the bitmap, there is no real point in actually saving the bitmap data to the tap file. We still could, but it's pointless. So we're changing the file name byte for the multiplexer demo from a five to the two there, and we are removing the bitmap data. Because this tape frame framework actually has the notion of file name bytes, it's possible, and the tape tool allows you to do this, it's possible to interleave the blocks from more than one file simultaneously. So if you had two levels like a branching point in the game, then you could save the two levels worth of data with interleaved blocks, but with different file name bytes. And as long as the file name byte numbers were different, then the game would load the specific level data that you only wanted and then it would skip the rest of the data. That would be a good way of like having a multi-load with a branch point where you're loading two different pieces of level data without needing to rewind or forward wind the, the tape. And there we go. So it wasn't displaying the bitmap, it just went from scrolling message to music to the multiplexer demo. So with the source code being available, you can uh, customize this framework as much as you like. You can reuse it in your projects. The license is completely free and open for anyone to use. It would just be nice if you uh, send me a copy of the thing that you're working on or add a credit or just say, hey, I'm using it in this project. Thank you very much. So I think we'll leave this video there. There isn't anything else to go into in this quick start. I hope you find this kind of stuff useful. And if you do, please do consider liking or subscribing to this channel. And also check out my other projects on the itch page. There are some game demos and there's some other source code for the multiplexer and there's the music editor and the music playing routines and sound effects routines and so on and so forth. So take care, have a great day or evening or night programming your Commodore 64 projects and I hope to catch you around next time. Take care wherever you are.